Hello, my name is Patrick Okocha. I am here to revise with you to prepare you for the forthcoming examination, uh, BSE 2020. The subject is pre-vocational studies, and I am here to revise with you on the topic, cultural practices. The cultural practices, as you all know, is the activities carried out in the farm before, then, during and after planting, after planting and harvesting of uh, crops. So it encompasses both choice of site and harvesting and storage of crops. Now, it can be subdivided into three, the pre-planting operation. So at the end, we are going to look at how to define cultural practices, how to differentiate between pre-planting, planting, and the post-planting operations. So now let's go over to pre-planting operations. Pre-planting operations are activities carried out in the farm before planting of fair crops. It includes one, choice of site. You look for a suitable site before planting. You are going to look, there are certain criteria to be put in place. Certain things are to be put in place before choosing a suitable farm site. It includes accessibility. Whether the land is accessible, is it close to the market? Is it, uh, uh, does the crop that you are going to plant can it sell? Is it secured against uh, those people that will come to vandalize or steal from the farm? Now, if you put all this in into consideration, you now choose a suitable, is the land, the topography of the land has to be put in place. Is the land on a steep slope or undulating? Is it uh, waterlogged or is it a dry land? Does it have uh, adequate, uh, does the soil there, is it rich? Does it contain adequate humus content that will enhance the growth of plants? After putting all this into consideration, you now choose the site. Number two is uh, clearing. After choosing your site, you clear. After clearing, you stomp. During clearing, there are certain tools that can be employed. Then, like the simple farm tools, the normal cutlasses. At times, we use the ash to cut down the big trees during clearing. Then after clearing, number three is stomping. Stomping means removing of uh, plant and animal residue on the soil in order to enhance the uh, region or making of mounds. Four. We have plowing. Plowing means breaking up of soil into clog. Clogs, big, big uh, clog. Then you harrow. Harrow simply means a process of removing uh, uh, plant and animal residue, remnants on the, the soil before you start making your ridges. It can be ridges, it can be beds, depending on your, the type of crop you want to plant. Then after ridging, you are true with pre-planting operation. So like I said, I mentioned choice of site, clearing of the soil, stunting, then plowing, harrowing, and ridging. These are the areas we look into. Then after pre-planting operation, we go for planting. Planting operation means the actual planting of crops. It includes the planting distance. Planting distance, that is the distance or spacing, as the case may be. Then we have your seed rate. Seed rate means the number of seeds per stand. For instance, if I want to plant maize and I want to make it 2-2 two, two per stand, my seed rate becomes 2. Then we have the planting date. The date you planted your crop should be specified. That will help you to know when they will germinate, 
and harvesting of uh, when you are going to harvest them. Then after the planting date, you also have what is called capping. Capping means using plants or natural material. That is, you can use natural or artificial materials to cover the, the young plants in order to prevent the loss of water or to protect them from being scorched by the sun. Not only that, you cap them by using cellophane, you can use nylon, you can use grasses. Their function is to reduce the loss of water through evaporation. Now, after that, we have what is called capping is different from mulching. Mulching means a process of covering the surface of the soil to prevent the loss of water. Then we have transplanting. Transplanting, moving the plants from the, uh, one place to another in order to create space to give them more accommodation to develop. It enhances optimum productivity. Apart from that, uh, we have seen the planting distance, the nursery. Nursery is very important. Most times you see that some seeds cannot survive if you plant them directly to the soil. So they need to be nurtured in a box or in a bed or a tray, as the case may be. That place is called the nursery. Until a time they can move them to their permanent site. Crops like tomatoes, pepper, uh, the green leaves, we have uh, your uh, jute, we have other small okra cannot be trans cannot be nursed in a, a a particular bed. They plant those ones directly. But the ones I mentioned are the ones you can raise in nursery because they cannot survive on their own. After nursery practices, we now go over to the next level which is post planting operation. Post-planting operations are activities carried out in a farm after planting. I wanted to mention during the pre-planting operation, or rather planting operation, seed testing. You test the seed for viability or vitality. Viability means the ability of a seed to germinate. Most times if you plant a seed, you think they will germinate because of men looking at them. But you discover that at the end they will not germinate because they are not viable. But vitality means the ability of the seed to grow rapidly after germination. So a seed can be viable but not viable. It can be viable but not viable. So a seed must be viable and must contain a lot of vitality before they can be regarded as a good seed for planting. So after that, yeah, how do we test a seed for viability? At times we look at them very well to see if there are broken parts of it. If the seed is broken in one part, it means they are not viable. Most times you see, we we'll put them in water. You can test them in water. You pour water on a bowl, then put the seed inside, pour the seed inside. The good ones will, will sink down, then the bad ones will now be floating. Then you decant and plant the viable ones. Not only that, to test seed for viability, you can also carry it out in the lab to know the percentage of germination. Then if the percentage of germination is high, it means that the entire seed is uh, viable. For example, if you plant 100 seeds of uh, okra, and at the end only six germinates, it means that the percentage of germination is low then such the entire seed is not viable. But if you plant 180, 90 or thereafter germinates, that's the, it means that the seed is viable. Not on, that's uh, for seed testing. Now let's go over to what I was discussing on post-planting operation. We have what is called supplying. Most times you may want a seed to be 2-2 per stand. But because of the adverse atmospheric condition, the, some of the seeds might be scorched, some of them may not germinate. Instead of two, there will be one. Instead of uh, three, there might be two. 
So you have to bring additional one to join, to make it uh, three or two. That is a kind of supplying. You are increasing the number of seedlings. Then thinning is opposite of supplying. Thinning is a process of removing extra seedling from a stand. For example, these days, most children are not, uh, if you ask them to go for planting without proper supervision, they can just go there because they want to be fast. Instead of planting 2-2, two, two, they might plant 5-5, five, 6-6, five, six, six, or 7-7. Seven, seven. Before you know it, they are true. Not knowing that all of them will germinate. By the time they germinate, you have to go back and reduce them. Reducing the number of uh, seed by stand is what is called thinning. At times, you, if you remove it and throw it away, they call it pricking out. You are not transplanted, but if you remove it and take it to a different site, that one is uh, transplanting. You are transplanting it from a permanent uh, place. Other post-planting operations are watering. You water your crops, fertilizer application, or manuring. Most times we use synthetic fertilizers like uh, the MPK 15-15-15. We can use a single fertilizer like uh, ammonium fertilizer. At times we apply uh, organic fertilizer uh, manure like the fine yard manure, green manure, and the compost manure. These are to enhance the growth of plants because they contain high uh, amount of uh, humus. They also facilitate the growth of uh, plants. They make the, plant, the soil to be compatible and then to the water holding, to improve the water holding capacity of the soil. Now we have watering, we have uh, disease, pest and disease control. If there is incidence of pests or diseases in the farm, and the farmer can take care of that during post-planting operation. Then we have uh, harvesting of crops, processing, and then you take them to the, the appropriate place. These are the three major cultural practices we know. The pre-planting uh, and uh, the pla uh, planting and post-planting operations. They are very important in agriculture because it will enhance optimum productivity of uh, crops. Now, in a nutshell, let us summarize what I have just said. We started by defining cultural practice to mean activities carried out in the farm before, during, and after planting of crops. We highlighted the three major uh, cultural practices to include pre-planting operations, planting operations, and post-planting operations. These are the three. We have also discussed them. We are going, I gave you instances. I know that by now you can be able to explain the meaning of seed rate. Because at times they may ask you, what are you doing in the farm? You say, I am planting. They will ask you, what is the seed rate? What they are asking you is to know the number of seed you are putting per stand. That is just that. Thank you very much for your patience. Once again, I am Patrick. I hope to see you in subsequent lesson. Thank you very much.
I will come back once again on this chemistry revision series. My name once again is Mrs. Ngeme Y-A-N. I'm a chemistry teacher. We're picking on the law of chemical combination this time. And in this law of chemical combination, we are taking the law of constant composition. And another name for this constant composition is the law of definite proportion. This law of definite proportion says that all pure samples of the same chemical compound contain the same elements combined together in the same proportion by mass. So when you are giving a definition, you must say exactly how it was set. No addition, no subtraction. Because if it is in Wayek, if you make a mistake in the definition, it is two marks or zero. So now we are giving you the definition. Several experiments were carried out where copper 2 oxide was prepared using different methods. The apparatus for the preparation of this copper 2 oxide includes copper foil, copper 2 tetrodosulfate solution, sodium hydroxide solution, hard glass tube, clamp, and porcelain boots. So in the first place, the first experiment that was carried out, copper foil was used, HNO3 was added and was put inside a foam cupboard. And at the end, black copper 2 oxide was produced. In the second experiment, copper 2 tetraoxosophysis reacted with sodium hydroxide and at the end, black copper 2 oxide was uh, produced. And in the third experiment, copper 2 thiazo carbonate 4 was used and at the end, black copper 2 oxide was produced. So these three samples of carbon, uh, copper 2 oxide were produced using different uh, methods. These copper 2 oxide that were produced were weighed and their weight noted. Then the, the copper 2 oxide was placed inside the porcelain boat. Both the copper 2 oxide and the porcelain boat were weighed and the weight was noted. Then this copper 2, the, the porcelain boat with copper 2 oxide were now placed into the hard glass tube and the tube was clamped and hydrogen gas was passed through the tube. As hydrogen gas passes through, the hydrogen will react with the oxygen in the, in the oxide and the water is formed. We see that this uh, hard glass tube is placed in a slopey manner, in a slopey way, so that the water will not flow back. Because if the water should flow back, it will make the salt to be wet. So the water form from the reaction between hydrogen and the oxide is settled at the lower part, leaving behind the reddish brown copper. These three coppers were now removed and weighed again, the weight noted. So the analysis of the results now is that the mass of the copper itself was weighed in the three porcelain boots then they will now analyze. The mass we are taking, we have the mass of porcelain boat, the mass of porcelain boat plus the oxide, the mass of oxide itself, the mass of copper that was produced. Now the question is, what is the mass of copper in the copper 2 oxide? So we look at it, pick the mass of copper itself, for instance, mass of copper here, we have 1.01 gram. A mass of copper 2 oxide is 1.25 gram in sample A. So to find the percentage by mass of copper, we now say mass of copper over mass of copper 2 oxide times 100 over 1. So we have 1.01 over 1.25 times 100 over 1. We now have 80.8%. Then in sample B, the mass of copper there is 0 0.92 grams. And mass of copper 2 oxide is 1.15 grams. So to find the percentage of copper in this one, we now place 0 0.92 over 1.15 times 100 over 1. You see how there 80.9. Then in this in sample C, we have mass of copper there is 1.15, mass of copper 2 oxide is 1.44. So we place mass 1.15 over 1.44 to 
times 100 over 1, we still have 79.8, that's 80. So if you look at the, the, the percentages obtained, we have 80, 80, 80. So it is in line. It, the, the mathematical expression agrees with the, line, with the mass, the law of constant air composition because they were all the same amount of air, copper. So the three samples contain the same amount of air, copper. Now, another boy went into the lab and produced magnesium oxide in three experiments. He was given 8.65 grams of oxide A and, and he obtained 8.00 grams of magnesium. It was, sample B was given 4.35 grams of oxide and he got 4.02 grams of magnesium. Sample C was 3.65 grams of oxide given and obtained 3.35 grams of magnesium. The question now is, what is the percentage of magnesium in the magnesium oxide? So the same thing with the other one. The analysis, you draw the table, putting the mass of oxide in sample A, sample B, sample C. In sample A, we have mass of oxide 8.65 grams. Sample B, 4.35 grams. Sample C, 3.65 grams. The mass of magnesium in sample A, we have 8 grams. In B, we have 4.02 grams. In C, we have 3.35 grams. Now the question, what is the percentage of magnesium in magnesium oxide? So we now place the mass of magnesium, which is 8.0 grams over 8.65 times 100 over 1. What we get, we have a 92%. Then in sample B, we say 4.02 grams over 4.35 grams times 100 over 1. We still have 92%. The third one will have 3.35 grams over 3.65 grams times 100 over 1, we still have 92. So we can see that from the calculation, the, the answer obey the law of constant composition because all pure samples contain the same elements combined together in the same proportion by mass. So they are all 92, 92, 92%. The results agree with the law of constant uh, composition. Now that we have 92, 92, 92, it shows that it obeys, it agrees with the law of constant composition. We now state the law. The law says that all pure samples of the same chemical compound contain the same elements combined together in the same proportion by mass. Without solving the mass, you cannot state the law because you may not know whether they are equal or there are gap between them. I hope you enjoy the lesson which will know that anytime you are asked to state the law, you must state it accordingly. Even at times you will be asked to state Charles law. The volume of a given mass of a gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. Why pressure remains constant. In that aspect, in Wayek market, if you give the wrong information, it's too much or zero. In this Charles law now, you see that if you don't put absolute 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 temperature no score if you don't put directly proportional no score likewise the boys law say the, the volume of a given mass of the gas is inversely proportional to its pressure temperature remains constant so if you state this law without putting inversely proportional it is two mass or zero so whenever you are asked to state any law state it as it was stated do not add and do not stop as i was saying we mentioned crucible. I hope you know how many of you have seen crucible before. A crucible is something like a small boat. Small boat that you can put inside the glass. Not just like a coffin, but it's small. So that crucible can withstand heat. And also the hard glass tube that was, if you use a lighter glass tube, it will crack. The glass tube that was used was a very tough one. Which we can, it is a heat a resistance. So you see that Inside the, the glass tube is where we place the, the crucible containing the, the copper. And from when the, it was copper to oxide that was placed there. But because the oxide has gone out, the color changed to brown. Because what was left inside the crucible was brown color, and that brown color is copper. 
You know you have seen copper wires before. If you look at copper wire that they used to wire this house, you know that it's brown in color. Because the first one was copper two oxide. As the hydrogen that passes through it, the oxygen was removed and then the brown copper was left. That oxygen was the one that reacted with a hydrogen that was passed through and water was formed. Assuming the water from the glass tube was slanting and it's not sloped, what will happen? You see that the water will run back. When the water runs back, it will now make the, the copper to be wet and it will turn back to its uh, uh, black color. So the glass tube that was sloping made the water to settle at the lower end and then we got our copper. You can see that copper can be produced with different metals getting the same thing. They use copper, copper foil, they use copper two tetrazo surfaces and sodium hydroxide, they use copper two tribal carbon four, and at the end copper was uh, produced. So when you look at the, the, the percentage of mass that was produced and we discover that they all have the same percentage by mass showing that they obey the law of definite uh, proportion. As I told you before, the law of definite proportion is the same thing as the law of constant composition. In case you come across them in the exam, do not be confused. They are the same thing. They ask you to define the law of definite proportion. They are telling you to define the law of constant composition. They are the same thing. Let's define it again that all pure samples of the same chemical compound, they contain the same elements, they combine together in the same proportion by mass. You have seen that the one from the mass mathematical expression we did, you see that they were 92, 92, 92 percent. So they obey the law of constant composition. I hope you understand. I hope you, you, you enjoy the lesson. If you, you enjoy the lesson, keep on reading your chemistry. Chemistry is an interesting subject. It's not an abstract subject. Some people say it's an abstract subject. With the experimental procedures, the chemistry is very, very enjoyable. The practical aspect of chemistry is very, very enjoyable. So I know that some students they run away from chemistry because of the IUPAC nomenclatures. When they say tetraozo surfaces, they say, hey, what is tetraozo? They say triazo carbonifer. They say, ah, that is what is driving some of them. But they are all interesting if you listen. If you listen well, you'll be able to enjoy it. Thank you for listening and God bless you.